a while I've been in the church. Constantly on the go. And you know, I read a piece of paper the other day in our uh, article, rather, in one of our local papers. They had a picture of the famous evangelist Billy Green. And it said up the top, wearing seam. And he had made a statement that among some theologians that he wasn't an aspect like he used to be. That he believed that some of the Bible really could be not inspired and a few that he might pretty soon leave the field of evangelism and and become some take some kind of offering for some great college or something on that order. Which to me, I don't believe he said it. Uh, I got better confidence in a man of God like Billy Graham than to make a statement like that. The papers make a lot of statements that's not true. Right. Right. I don't believe Billy said it. But if he did say it, I would say that one thing would be like Billy, would be like it is with many of our other evangelists, and with myself. And I hope you read between the lines what I'm saying. Sometimes our zeal burns up our wisdom. Yeah, yeah. We try to go too long, too hard. We get wore down. Get to a place you can't think right. Seems like, oh, I don't know. Sometimes I get feeling like that, I'll just kind of be glad when I hear the trumpet sound. <laughs> I think it'll all be over. The any more struggle, the more heartache. Coming home, you don't want to come. You don't know what it is until you go through it once. I know you can wear it then. Jack Cole wore just a little too thin once. And if you don't watch, Tommy Hicks is more thin, pretty thin, and you know that. Just as soon as he comes from overseas, somebody grabs him here and there. He's had a breakdown. I know I wore off a thin one time. Yeah. And I'm getting thin again. But how can you sit still when thousands are calling and pulling around? Oh, I thought, well, Lord, last fall when I come back from Brother Bowen or the Christian business man over on the little town of vacation, I thought, well, Lord, I'll step in the harness and stay until you come and we sober. I would rather die in the harness than out of the harness. So, when we're thin and wearing thin and so forth, as I've just stated, we get tired of my throat giving down. But to come into a time like this where we sit in a little gathering, and I wonder if the Lord don't just let us get all tore up sometimes, or he could just mold us and fashion us and make us a little different and bless us and kiss us on the cheeks and say, my child and I wish you and I'll give you just a little encouragement. Go ahead. Now, I would like to approach a, a subject here <coughs> that I, I know is entirely uh, too much of a subject for me. And before ministers, anyhow, that I kind of a little ticklish about uh, approaching it, a little skittish, I should say, but uh, I trust that you'll bear with me that I express my thoughts on a scripture that I want to read out of the book of Joel. First chapter, one, a verse, and the second chapter, of verse, the fourth and the the twenty fifth. In Joel, the first chapter says, "That which the palmer worm has left, as the locust eaten. That which the locust has left, as the uh, I'm making the part. I'm reading it wrong." That which the palm worm has left as the locust eaten, and that which the locust has left the canker worm has eaten. 
And that which the, I mean the caterpillar has eaten, that which the caterpillar has eaten, as it, or canker worm has eaten, as the caterpillar. I'm all mixed up again. But standing here with tears in my eyes and shaking on. Well, I'll read it again. That which the palmer worm has left as the locust eats, and that which the locust has left as the canker worm eats, that which the canker worm has left as the caterpillar eats. And then over in Joel 2.25, I will restore unto you. Our precious Lord, as a bunch of pilgrims and strangers, we humbly bow in your presence, first of all to ask you to forgive us for all of our trespasses. Yes, and to say within ourselves that we are unworthy of any blessing that you should give to us. And we have come this morning as a group of people under the old oak tree as it was to sit around for a little time of fellowship. And I pray thee God to be merciful to on us and to give unto us that which we have need of. May the great Holy Spirit now come among us and come upon each of us and give us the food from the Bible that we have need of. Bless this group of men. Bless this gathering. Bless the revival and the Christian businessman. And for everything that's been done or said during this meeting. And we pray that in the end, we'll hear those wonderful words. It was well done, my good and faithful Enter into the joy of the Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord add his blessings to his word. And now on this subject that I would just like to briefly say because I know we got lots of things to do and it's ten minutes after ten. You know there's none of us just alike. If we should all go up this morning and then give us a fingerprint, we'd find out there's those two fingerprints exactly alike. That's known. They claim that no two people got noses just exactly alike. We're so different, uh, one to the other, and in many makeup. But we can certainly agree that we're all human. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and in our religious beliefs, we find the same thing. We find that some believe one thing and some another. But I've always tried to make it a policy to never try to cross up anybody, to do anything wrong. I, when I come out of the Baptist church, I've ever went across the country telling what a bad bunch of people the Baptists are. I go across the country telling what a fine bunch of people the Baptists are. Because they are. I might not agree with them just on everything. But I certainly would take one of them before I would take an unbeliever, before I would take a communist. Or like that. As long as they are mentioning the name of the Lord, though I wouldn't believe with them, I certainly, we might not believe on every principle, but we believe on Christ. Amen. Amen. That's the main thing. I wouldn't mean to speak evil of the Baptists or the Presbyterians or not even to the Catholics. Because there's Catholic people who I believe are saved. God has so made it so simple to us that he that believeth on me. And there's many of them. I wouldn't believe the system of the Catholic Church, but I believe in the Catholic people. 
I don't believe in the system of the, maybe the Baptist or Presbyterian or even the Pentecostal sometimes. But I believe in their people because they're my brothers and sisters. Now, in our short message, I have just, the first time I've ever tried to write down something, just a point that I wanted to make and come to it. Because not only to preach, I didn't come to preach, I just come to speak to you. And I'm, I preach by inspiration, I try to. But in speaking like this, I just want to talk to you. But there's four great things here that I want to mention. And that is Joel the prophet, who was God's eagle, who climbed up into the sphere of God and saw the day coming. Peter quoted him on the day of Pentecost in Joel 2.38. He says, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. That's right. That's right. And Joel saw that coming. And if Joel's prophecy was so accurate that it saw Pentecost many hundred years before it ever happened, then surely the prophecy that he has given to this day, we could say, would be accurate. But the thing I want to speak on is this. The four great destroyers. First, it was the the palmer worm, and the next was the locust, and the next was the canker worm, and the next was the caterpillar. Them were destroyers, and what they were destroying was the heritage of God, the vine. And if you will check closely on your insects, those three or those four insects are the same insect in a different form. The caterpillar and the uh, locust, the canker worm and the, I mean the, I get that mixed up. The first was the palmer worm and then the locust and then the canker worm and the caterpillar. We are told that that is the same insect in just different forms coming down. Now, if Pentecost was God's vine, which was the new vine that had grown up, then these four destroyers has been the one that eats the vine down. Now let's find out what Pentecost had and find out what we got lacking. And then we ought to find out what the destroyers are, or who they are, Amen. or what did it. Now, the first thing that Pentecost produced was brotherly love. Yes, sir. Amen. Right. It tore down the middle wall of petition and made a brotherhood to such a way that they had everything in common in the Bible days. A brotherhood. Paul spoke of this brotherhood and he gave all the gifts of the Pentecostal church and then said in First Corinthians 13, that though I speak with tongue as man and angel, and have not this love which brings the brotherhood, I am nothing. That's right. That's right. And though I have the knowledge to understand all the mysteries of God, I am still nothing without love, the love of the brethren. Jesus said, This will all men know that you're my disciples. Right. When you have love one for the other. Pentecost had that. 
I'm speaking Pentecost, meaning the first group of the apostles and the disciples. They had that brotherly love. They wasn't greedy. They sold everything they had for the furthering of the church. They were so together that even when one heard the other one died, he said, let us go and die with him. Such a feeling. Now, Jesus spoke of this and said that Paul and others said, let brotherly love continue. That was in the first church. But something taken place. And there was a fellow come in by the name of a Palmer one. And when he began to eat on that vine of brotherly love, he cut the very sap line of it. Because it don't make any difference how smart we are, how much we think we know, or how much we want to be different from somebody else. As long as that brotherly feeling isn't among us, we are fighting a losing battle. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. We can't win. There's no way for us to win. And now, in the Pentecostal church of today, comparing the two, and what's happened, now, if you'll notice the routine of the gift, the first is the gift of wisdom. Thank you. The first is the gift of wisdom. That is the best gift of the group. And if we don't have wisdom, we won't know how to use knowledge. Is the second gift. And if we can't use the second gift without wisdom, how are we going to use the last gift? Interpretation. Or next to the last, speaking in tongues. Our zeal has eat up our wisdom, and our zeal for our denomination and our enthusiasm has eat up the wisdom of the divine, brotherly love. It's all right, and you, brethren, the reason I said for you to come this morning, I want to speak to ministers. It's all right to have denominations. There's nothing against that. But when denomination isolates himself and separates his fellowship from his brethren, that old palmer worm has eaten the life out of it to begin with. When we get to a place, if you want to differ with a man, why, if man that I know, that I could see eye to eye with as close in scriptures as anybody in the world, is Brother Moore said here. But oh, do we this time for the we're a million miles apart. <laughs> but did that ever touch us? <laughs> no, sir. Here in the end of the little wife over yonder, answering the phone so much that she's got almost a nervous breakdown. Call last night, crying on the phone. And he loves me well enough, not because he gets a penny of money, no, sir. But he flies on an old rocking plane and everything else to get over here to be with me a little bit. I don't believe the night would ever be too dark or the rain would ever fall too hard but what I'd climb and crawl through the jungle to get to me. It's a love. And yet we wouldn't agree on scriptures by a hundred miles on millenniums and so forth like that on the security of believers. <laughs> but that don't make it. I'm even he's in, even in our difference, I am elected so shake country. 
Right. I'm so glad that the palm of one hasn't touched the jet brother right before now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Now, I'm just saying that for an example. And if we could do that between two men, why can't every brother do it? That's right. Oh, God. Yeah. I might have a right to say things against a certain thing. I went to his church here not long ago, and I thought he never would invite me back. Mm -hmm. Well, I've come to find out that godly bunch of little saintly women he had there was bobbing off their hair and wearing lipstick. I tore the thing apart. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought he wouldn't ask me back. But you know what? There was such an anointing of the Holy Spirit around the vine that that old palmer worm couldn't touch it. <laughs> you know, there's electric fence right. <laughs> that palmer worm can't get over that fence. That shock of the Holy Spirit of love. You're killing every time, brother. And if we need fences to build, it oughtn't to be denominational fences. It ought to be love fences to keep the out. Let's keep the calmer one. For he is the devil's number one destroyer. I don't care what a man believes. Whatever he believes, now he's got a right to come right back and tell me he don't believe little things that I believe. i got a right to say little things that he doesn't believe. In this church, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, even to the Pentecostals. See? Whatever. I'm with the Pentecostal people. I am Pentecost. I don't belong to the Pentecostal denomination because Pentecost is not a denomination. Amen. It's an experience. Did you hear that Lutheran say a while ago? I will shut hands with the Baptist setting over there coming down. I believe there's another Baptist looking at me there to check a town or what? See? It is an experience. That's right. And the trouble of it is we let these Insects get in a pair of species. And that is the number one killer. That's what's eating in our Pentecostal experiences today. Now, the next great thing come up was the locust. And he was the one who was to destroy the unity of the believers. In the Bible, there was, in Pentecost, there was a unity. And these people were with one heart and with one accord. Yes. And Paul said, I believe in Romans, the seventh chapter, that there was nothing to separate us from the 8th chapter of Romans, of the love of God that's in Christ. Jesus. Thank God. There was nothing. Now, I've never expressed this before between Pentecostal people, or anyone. But seeing the tremendous strain that's been on me, that's why I come to do it this morning. It's the mightiest church on the face of the earth. The Lord. And it is the church. That's right. That's right. That's right. There's only one church. Many of them are still branded Baptists, Presbyterians. But I might not look like it this morning, but I, I used to herd a few cattle. And up there in Colorado, where we graze on the Repertoire Forest, and and bring the cattle down on the Troubled River Association, Herbert Association grazes the, has the ranches down on the Troubled River. At Roundup time, at the spring when we brought the cattle up to put them on there, many times have I set there with my leg across the horn of the saddle, watched the ranger count those cattle as they went through. And I was amazed to look. Some of them had 
the Lazy K brand on them. Some of them had the Diamond Bar brand on them. Ours was a tripod. Uh, others was a different brand. The Ranger, the brand didn't make much difference. But everyone that passed through that gate had to be a registered Herford. That's what I think it'll be at the day of the judgment. <laughs> it won't be whether you're a Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian, but what brand you got on you. But it'll be a born again experience. Oh, the only oh, thing that we'll ever do. So not only among the Pentecostal denominations, but all denominations, this great Palmer worm has broke down brotherhood. It did it with the Lutherans, it did it with the Baptists, it did it with the Presbyterians, it did it with the Nazarenes, it did it with the Pentecostals. It's always been that old worm in there to make them isolate themselves. We got it and you ain't got nothing. What a pity. Recently at a meeting were a, a Lutheran group of people, a dean of a college, had Brother Moore and I there, and he so differed with me, but what got him was in the supernatural. And he called me out to have dinner with him. And they were sitting there as many as we did this breakfast. And then when we got through eating and was explaining to him, he wanted to know what we Lutherans had. And I said, well, do you say, he said to me, do we Lutherans have anything? I said, sure. Yes, yeah, Christ. I said, I'll make it to you in a parable. A man once planted a field of corn. And he went out in a few days and he looked and there were little, two little sprouts sticking up like this. And the man began to praise God for a field of corn. I said, did he have corn? He looked at me. He said, well, perhaps in a sense he had corn. I said, he had corn potentially. By and by that corn matured. And after a while it becomes a tonsil. I said, the first two leaves are you losing. First Reformation. And after a while, along come the tonsil. That tonsil looks so pretty. He looked back down to the leaf and said, I haven't got nothing to do with you. I'm a pretty tonsil, and you aren't nothing but just an old green leaf. But if the truth was known, the very life that was in the leaf is made the tonsil. Amen. And it has to have the leaf to drop its pollen to further on towards maturity. After a while, the ear comes, has grains on it, the Pentecostal, restoration of the gift, like the one that went in the ground, the return of the power of God in fullness, showing Christ alive at Pentecost to the gifts and manifestations of the first church. But you know when this ear of corn come on, it looks back to that talk and says, you ain't got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't even in it. Oh. And you old dead loose and leaves down there, there's nothing to you. But brothers, remember, the life that's in the green coming out of the leaf also is the possible. It's nothing but a corn further matured. So don't laugh at the Luther and the Baptist. Remember, it's a further matured of the ear. But now the thing about this, we've had that in our minds so long, until it has created another thing. And we got fungus growing out all over the years. You know what fungus is? <laughs> well, you know what fungus is what brain is. It's something wrong. Something 
is wrong with the tree that has fungus on it. It's got a disease. And Pentecost has got a disease. It's got a lot of fungus growing on it. That's right, in, the, in our, all of our churches. It's got fungus growing on it. We've got the old Palmer one come along with his stinger. Break down brotherhood. Break down unity among us. Paul said in the Bible that he wanted us to all speak the same thing. He wanted us all to be in unity. I got a little note right here. I was going to uh, read on it. All the operation of the gifts and so forth. And in unity they stood as one great big union church. But we find out that that church stayed that way with brotherhood and they loved not their lives unto death. They went out in martyrdom. Many of you, many of you who are scholars, you read uh, the, well, the early ages of the church and books like Pop's Book of Martyrs and so forth and many other church, uh, church uh, histories. And how did they stuck together? Nothing could separate them. Then, during the dark age, they come forth with an organization. They come forth with a man-made policy. The locusts begin to fly then. The same devil that broke up brotherhood is trying to break the unity of man. And they made their first organization, and that was the Catholic Church. God's church never was organized in from Catholicism. And then it was a force that you had to do it. Or they pulled them apart with ox, they burned them, they set them to lines, they done everything. And they forced in a false unity. The locusts begin to sting. And it's too fast. After the caterpillar has got into the Pentecostal church and broke up the brotherhood, then the locust comes around after that and begins to sting us to organize different little groups to break up our unity. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the destroyers. If the old general council, when the Pentecostal move was first brought in, issued in by speaking with tongues, the bottom of the gift, bring it up, if they would have just stayed put and would have never organized and just let it be a Pentecostal fellowship, in the sin of any organization, we'd have been a million times better off. Right. 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 And let us say our experience and not a denomination. Now remember, I'm stating myself, I'm not against the denomination. It has to be that way, or God's word would have said it would be that way. Amen. If these caterpillars and bugs are going to eat the church, they're going to eat it. Amen. That's right. God said so. That's just as plain as He said He poured out His Spirit. What God says for one thing, whether it's good or evil, it's going to be just that way. But I'm just, I'm just bringing out something to your view so you can see. Now the caterpillar uh, begins to eat, or the locust other, and he broke up a disunity. And they organized the first church. Luther organized the second, and on down through the age, and it's constantly one organization. And when you do, you tear down the very principle of brotherhood. Brother, to my opinion, if we are mentally right, we don't. We see God's Bible, look out upon the thing, and you see that it's that way. That's right. That's right. We are not divine. Oh, one body we. One in hope and doctrine. 
One in charity. Praise the Lord. What are we going to do about that? Here we are. Could we help it? No, sir. God said so. That's it. They could not help doing this. I wonder when we stand before Jesus in that great day. And as the patriarchs stood before Joseph, and they were condemning themselves. We knew we did this. We should not have done this. And he said, it was all for the good. I wonder really if all of our differences and everything, when we come that day and say, oh, Lord, if I didn't know that, I'd never done this. But what if he just say, well, it was all for the good. It might preserve life in some way. But to think that old locust, what it's done. And then another thing that they had back in the Bible times, now besides brotherhood, perfect brotherhood, perfect unity, they had a worship of one true God. And it's too bad that we got away from that. Now in the day of the early age, there's come a time when they set up a post and made him a god. Give him a triple crown. The jurisdiction over heaven, purgatory, and hell. I've seen his crown. I looked at it myself. And they begin to come to a man worship. And they've been set up from the worship of the one true God to a false earthly God and got priests in there called them fathers. Ghostly fathers. The Bible plainly told us call no man father but God. And to worship no man but God. I wouldn't want to say that it was a grand privilege, but I was given the privilege to be interviewed by the Pope when I was in Rome. And I have seen many diplomats and great men and kings and potentates, monarchs, and I met them and they told me different things I should do and how I should address them. And when I went to them, your honor and so forth and and um, majesty and so forth I was to say. So I asked this person what I was to say at three o'clock the next afternoon when I was to meet the Pope of Rome, the head of the Catholic Church. And he said the first thing you must do would be bow down on your knees and kiss the rain and call him his holiness, I said, just take it off the list. Amen. <laughs> I would not pay that respect to any earthly man. Hallelujah. If he is a minister, or whatever, or elder, whatever you wish to be called, all right, but never do worship to a man. But they had the worship of one true God. In that little faction, they set up in the program, which many of you historians know, of making the Trinity three different gods. They had one God the Father with a long beard. I've seen the pictures of that and that and that. They had another God the Son with a younger man and a little bird flying around like a dove calling the Holy Ghost. Now they lost sight there of the true picture of the one true God. God is not three gods. God is one God. That's right. God has three offices, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but it isn't three different gods, if it is, we're pagans. 
But that never started in the early church. They know different from that. It started in the Middle Ages when the unity of brethren was broke up and the love. Now, of course, we people today, we believe that the three, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, is the three uh, persons of the one true God. It's three offices, not three gods. But that same, listen now, we think that was ridiculous in the Catholic Church, but we brought it right down here at Pentecost and tore yourselves to pieces with it. Set up another organization. Start something else. Instead of coming like brethren with brotherly love and with unity, the first one begins to see the the, the three persons of the Godhead was in one person, Christ Jesus. He was the manifestation of God in flesh. Not another man. And then you set up and got the little dogmatic idea of the oneness to call. Then you started on that, being a harp on it, and you made God one like your finger one, and you know that's wrong. You better scholars know better than that. But what was it? It was because the Palmer one began to eat first. Instead of setting and reason together, when I come into the factions of the Pentecostals, they set a table bigger than that with their heads around. You go to this, you can't go to this. You preach for them, you can't preach for this. Yeah. I said, we are brethren. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And if the one this faction had to went off to one side and made an issue out of it, and would have stayed with their brethren yeah. and let the Holy Ghost anoint them, yeah. Yeah. that thing would have never Pattern and broke up brotherhood the way it did. Right, right, right. But what happened? The locusts begin to fly. <laughs> broke up brotherhood as, as a little unity of your own. Unity is not an isolated thing, brethren. Unity is for the whole body of Christ. It started in the early days. Paul said, When I come among you, one has this, one has that. One said, I'm a Cephas, I'm a Paul. The Cephas crucified, was he baptized in the name of Paul? But that thing had already started. He was eating into the church. But they had in the beginning the unity of the one true God. Just a few days ago, I got a letter from Africa. Brother Jesus. Now I want you to notice there are these two factions of the men. They have a time of baptism. And one side baptizes three times. Once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Ghost, they forward. <laughs> said Jesus, when he died, we baptized in his death, and he fell, they forward. The other said, Siri. When Jesus died, they bury him in on his back, so they baptized him three times backwards. Once for the Father, once for the Son, once for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and they split up. My goodness, brethren. Did you see? Don't you understand? Let it be a vision to you. What difference does it make? When we have lost our feeling of brotherhood, we are in a terrible state. Yeah. 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 Do you get it? Yeah. But these little things that break out, then somebody grabs it. We may have the unity. That's not unity. That's pure petty jealousy. Yeah. Christian apostolic unity. Okay. Yes. Paul said some preach for one thing and some preach for more gain and 
What difference? He said, as long as Christ is free. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank the Lord. Oh. He had a right to call out and said, I know that after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in us. And some among you will raise up with diverse things and so forth. But John tried to cap it all said, Oh, keep Christ, the unity of Christ, the love of God in our hearts. Little children love one another. I believe we have to go through these things before we can really see the real meaning of them. John, who was the one who wanted to call far down out of heaven and burn up Samaria that day because they wouldn't give him something to say, wouldn't become the very fun of love. I wonder, brother, if someday in all of our differences, when we really see the vision that God is trying to get before us, if it just won't break us right down one of those right there. Another thing that they had in that day was absolutely a soundness of Bible teaching. That was one of the things they had. Which is the palmer worm and the caterpillar, and if you notice, it's the same insect all the way down. Now this old devil of canker worm has come in, and he crawls in the skin, too, you know, canker you up. One fellow will find a little thing, and when he does, it don't make any difference what somebody else tries to say. He'll just hold to that, and he'll isolate his little group, and there's nothing but this is it. Brother, it ain't this is it. This is that. That's the thing. A fellowship. A true Bible teaching. Not going out after one thing or another. We've got genuine spirit filled Holy Ghost brethren. If I would direct my message towards one of them. I'd be a hypocrite. I don't speak against saying the Baptist church does this, the Methodist church does that, and this does that, or this does that. I'm not preaching against the man. I'm preaching against that devil of a canker worm that's trying to get a hold of mankind. And we see it. We I brought this so that we can lay it out before each other. That we can see that these destroyers was predicted to come and eat the vine down. Yeah, yeah. Now we know the Holy Ghost is here. Uh, we know the Holy Ghost is life. Yeah, yeah. But brothers, do you realize it's only working in a stump? Amen. Uh, 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 Did you think that? Do you realize that's the point, my friend? The Spirit is only working in a stump. The Bible said it would be a stump. What is it? We've got disunified bodies. We've got brotherly love scattered from side to side. Way down in the heart of every born again man, the point in their heart, they want to embrace one another. There's a many a preacher here who seems to belong to the churches of different denominations who would love to walk in here this morning and take the oneness and the two-ness and the three-ness and forget their differences. Christ is in their hearts. But what is it? What's keeping them from it? Their organization. If oh. they get caught in that bunch of excommunicated, that's a false unity. Oh. The Bible said so. That's right. God never did organize his church. Now, don't be against that. God said it had to happen. Yeah, but the thing that it is among all of it, Let's be brethren. Then we find out all these great things, and here we are just done. Here's this final start. And when it does, the palm will cut down the brotherhood. 
What comes next? That's where our palmer worm dies and turns into a locust, and he goes to sting you. Then the locust goes and in comes the canker worm. The canker worm leaves and here comes the caterpillar to get what's left. See? Right back to the stump it goes. And brother, this morning, with the life coming up from the roots, Christ Jesus, because he was the root and offspring, we, by our indifferences, have let these things cut us and keep us a stump. Is there any hope then, you say, brother Brown? Bless be to God, I will restore yeah. the yeah. 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 All the years, the blessings that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the power worm, and everything is eaten down, and brethren, as a middle-aged man, as a preacher of the gospel, your brother, which loves you with Christian love, I'm looking to see the day soon when those canker worms and caterpillars will be sprayed with God's insect powder. And every church will embrace one another, man shall be brethren. And now, for a real thought of this, if God said these insects would eat down his heritage, can you see, brethren, divine healing? Why it doesn't operate like? Can you see how gifts don't operate like? The spirits, they'll get into the church and some with tongues will speak irreverently. Some of them will pay no attention to it. Others will say that message wasn't right. They let this go and that go. Then the gifts will come and they all, Jones said this was this and this was that. It's the Holy Spirit truly. But it takes gifts through to produce itself. These little insects are keeping it down. That's the reason we can't have real. Why this great power that's in the church is a swiffer from sea to shining sea. The great church of the living God should be sent to the Here comes the caterpillar. Oh, God. Oh, God. But one great thing, God said it would be that way. We see it. God said, I will restore. Amen. I'm looking for it. Amen. 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 Amen.